years ago, I was sitting on a train, and it was quiet, fairly empty. And then at this one stop, a bunch of people got on, and as they were all inching towards their seats, I glanced up and did a double take and exclaimed, you're Dr. Villainer S. Ramachandran. And the guy was like, yes, yes, I am. He seemed a little bit confused to be recognized. Dr. Ramachandran is a neuroscientist, and I think he asked me if I was a student at the university where he does research. And I'm like, no, I'm a programmer. And then I blurted out, I live with a synesthete. And then the encounter was over. <laughs> now, this is somewhat less of a non sequitur than it perhaps sounds like. Ramachandran did groundbreaking work on synesthesia, which is a little bit of neural cross-wiring. For someone with synesthesia, a sensory receptor will be activated, the signal will travel to the brain where it triggers a sensory perception, and there it will bleed over into a nearby part of the brain which triggers a secondary perception. So they might activate a pain receptor, and they will feel pain, and it might also cause them to hear a certain tone, or they'll hear a sound, and it might have visual texture or have some particular taste. One of my classmates at university always organized everything on her desk in pairs because two is such a cheerful, cuddly number. Three, on the other hand, was positively dreary. She didn't like three at all. This secondary perception is incredibly stable over time. And some people with synesthesia can use this extra layer of perception to help orient themselves. One woman I read about knows that it's time to see a dentist when her toothache turns orange. There's an Australian opera singer whose synesthesia gives her an extraordinarily detailed memory for sounds. Her name is Priscilla Dunstan, and about 25 years ago, Dunstan had a baby. Now, those first few weeks and months as a new mother can be incredibly tough. You're hopelessly sleep deprived, the baby cries, you have no idea how to fix it, and often new parents will feel helpless and isolated, and people promise them that they will start recognizing different cries, but Dunstan, despite her incredible memory for sounds, wasn't hearing it. And finally, one desperate morning, she started keeping a detailed log of all of her baby's cries, and slowly she came to the realization that there was no distinction. A cry was just a cry. But there were specific sounds at the very beginning of a cry, and as she listened and experimented, that pre-cry fussiness started sounding more and more distinct. I'm hungry was very different from I have gastrointestinal discomfort. And in time, she reliably assigned meanings to five different pre-cry sounds that her son made. And then eventually, she started getting out of the house more where other babies were hungry and tired and needed to be burped, and to her astonishment, they seemed to be expressing this in ways that were remarkably similar. She was hearing it, and others were not. When we talk about expertise and mastery, we tend to talk about knowing facts, being able to explicitly verbalize concepts, being able to execute specific sequences of steps. One of the characters in the King Killer Chronicles observes that playing music is a lot like telling a joke. Anyone can remember the words. Anyone can repeat it. But making someone laugh requires more than that. Telling a joke faster doesn't make it funnier. An expert isn't just a faster novice. Experts seem to have this magical thing. We call it insight, judgment, intuition, brilliance. They got that way because of some unarticulated range of experiences, practice perhaps, or seasoning, the enigmatic passage of time. In an experiment, researchers gave terrain analysts two minutes to look at an aerial photograph. Now, two minutes is not a lot. It typically takes hours to do a proper analysis. And after two minutes, one of the engineers started his debrief with an offhand comment that whoever got sent to the area needed to be prepared for certain types of bacterial infections. And the researcher was like, what, you can see bacteria on a picture taken from 40,000 feet? And the engineer was like, well, the photo showed a tropical climate, and the vegetation was mature and uniform, so the contours to the top of the tree canopy uh, reflected 
the underlying soil, and since the soil layer would be relatively thin, the contour to the top of the tree canopy reflected the underlying bedrock, which would be tilted interbedded limestone. And so there was one pond that uh, didn't seem to have a major distributary running away from it, so given the climate and the vegetation and the stagnant water, the presence of bacteria was a sure bet. Experts have a hard time explaining what they do or how they know. They just know. Their skill is consistent and reliable and kind of mysterious. So if you can't explain it, and you don't even necessarily know what it is, how do you teach it? How do you teach seasoning and perspicacity and judgment? How do you teach intuition? In Japan, at the turn of the previous century, there were people who could look at a Dale chick and determine whether it was male or female. Now, this might not seem very uh, important or particularly impressive, but it led to massive price reductions worldwide. And this is because without a chick sexer on staff, they were spending six weeks feeding chicks before they could reliably tell if it was a girl chicken or a boy chicken, and the boy chickens are apparently of no use to the poultry industry. Not only do cockerels not lay eggs, they're also typically smaller, their meat is stringier, and I'm told they're troublemakers. And this gets expensive at an industrial scale. So the Japanese founded a school in the 1920s to train new chick sexers. And the thing is, most of the time, chick sexers literally could not tell you how they knew. Most of the time, they were incapable of pointing out any particular diagnostic structure that they were relying on to make the determination. So the training consisted of pairing a novice up with an expert and having the novice guess, male or female, and the expert would tell them yes or no for two years. After that point, the newly graduated chick sexers were sexing up to 1,200 chicks per hour with an accuracy rate of 97%, all without being able to tell you how they knew. Now, there's an epilogue to this story. <clears throat> Several decades later, someone came along and was like, well, actually, there is this one simple rule, and if you follow it, it gets you like 80% of the way there. So I don't know, uh, chick sexers may have gone the way of leech collectors, but this doesn't change the fact that the Japanese method of training expert chick sexers totally worked. Traditionally, we're really good at training the deliberate part of the brain. We write tutorials and coursework, we devise drills and practice problems, we assign homework. We are not so good at training the automatic part of the brain. We're exposed to all of these chaotic signals our whole lives, and the brain just kind of picks through it and figures stuff out implicitly. And it turns out there is an entire field of psychology dedicated to understanding the conditions under which the brain figures this stuff out. And it all started in the 1960s with a re researcher named Eleanor Gibson. I'm having trouble with this clicker. I'm going to move on to the manual method here. Uh, so Eleanor Gibson. She designed this delightful experiment uh, that illustrated unambiguously the fundamental building block of our ability to develop accurate snap judgments. So she'd start by showing the research subject a completely meaningless squiggle. And then she'd explain that she would show them a series of squiggles, and would they please identify all of the squiggles that matched this reference squiggle exactly. And then she would flip through them one by one, and the research subject would make their guesses, and she didn't give them any feedback at all. And after they'd gotten through the entire deck, she would start over. This is the reference squiggle. Identify the squiggles that match. Still no feedback. By the third time through, the research subject would have correctly identified every single target squiggle. Their brain was discovering different meaningful squiggle dimensions. As they were shown the squiggles, they would suddenly notice that some squiggles went one way, whereas others went the other way. A squiggle might have three or four or five spirals, and the overall shape of the squiggles varied. Some were round and some were kind of squished. Our brains are constantly going through this process of differentiation, figuring out which characteristics matter and which don't. As the brain discovers which dimensions are important, it starts paying closer attention to those dimensions. And as we pay closer attention, our brains begin to make finer discriminations. Our perceptual resolution increases. Photographers gain a richer experience of light. Musicians gain 
a richer experience of sound. Industrial tasters gain the ability to evaluate mayonnaise across 14 different dimensions of flavor. <laughs> this field of study is called perceptual learning. It explores the specific ways in which the perception of experts differs from that of novices. There is a fundamental difference between how the brains of novices and expert, experts extract information. For example, novice drummers sight read rhythms note by note. They think about rhythms in terms of how long each note lasts. Experienced drummers, on the other hand, don't read note for note, they read beat for beat. Each beat has a distinct rhythmic figure. And they think about that figure as one coherent idea. There aren't that many different rhythmic configurations that happen on a single beat. So over time, drummers begin to recognize these figures at a glance. Novices see lots of low-level pieces of data, whereas experts see chunks and higher order relations. When navigating an unfamiliar public transit system, we look at every surface, every sign, every blinking light, every arrow. We carefully parse and analyze, and for good luck, we cross our fingers, and we still manage to take the right train in the wrong direction, or get off at the wrong stop, or exit on the northeast side of the station rather than the south side of the station. And then over time, as we get used to traveling in the city, our brains start attenuating a lot of the irrelevant signs and signals we automatically start focusing in on the few cues that happen to be relevant. Novices pay attention to both relevant and irrelevant data. They can't help themselves. Experts often don't even notice irrelevant data. They also can't help themselves. As we gain experience, our brains amplify relevant characteristics and attenuate or even filter out irrelevant ones. And a lot of this happens before the signals reach the part of the brain where we're aware of perceiving things. Now, both units and selectivity are about how we extract information. Another stark difference between novices and experts is how efficiently they extract information. Experienced pilots can determine aircraft attitude and situation with a bare glance at their instrument panel. Inexperienced pilots, on the other hand, read and cross-check their instruments carefully one instrument at a time. Novices process things serially, whereas experts have a much greater tendency to process things in parallel. Also, novices process slowly, whereas experts extract information quickly, and finally, whether sight reading drum notation or navigating a public transit system or cross-checking aircraft instrument panels, novices are going to be drained after doing it. And for the experts, the effort will hardly register at all. So that's the basic science. Discovery effects are about how we extract information. It's about patterns and filtering incoming signals and fluency effects are about how efficiently we extract information. The reasoning of novices is slow, and it's serial, and it's capacity constrained, and the perceptual processes of experts are fast and parallel, and they don't drain cognitive resources. Now where this gets interesting is when you take this basic idea and figure out how to use it to explicitly train intuition. There's a cognitive scientist named Philip Kelman who's spent the past 30 or 40 years exploring this question. And one of the really interesting things uh, about Kelman's work is that he's not gonna train your intuition so that you're better able to differentiate the angle of a line on a computer screen in a research lab. He picks complex skills that address actual real world problems. So some of his early stuff in the 1990s was inspired by the fact that every year you had pilots that would land at the wrong airports or they would get lost flying cross-country in the US. And there is a skill that pilots have. And the better they are at it, the less likely they are to get lost flying cross-country. And that skill is visual navigation. You look out the uh, cockpit window, you eyeball the terrain, and then you look at a map and you decide if you're in the right place. Pilots are not explicitly trained for this skill. They develop it over time through experience. So. To test the visual navigation skills of experienced pilots, Kelman showed them 20 seconds of video taken from an airplane cockpit. And then he showed them a map with three locations marked on it, one of which matched the video that they had just been shown. And the pilots spent an average of 30 seconds making their choice. And they chose the correct location 
about 50% of the time. In other words, they may learn this through experience. They don't necessarily learn it particularly well. So Kelman's team then put each pilot through three hours worth of perceptual training. And the training consisted of short interactive trials that were exactly like the test, basically. 20 seconds of video, choice of three locations on a map. And by the, time, uh, by the end of the three hours, the pilots were getting the right answer about 80% of the time. And they were spending less than 15 seconds making their choice. Now, in an interesting twist, Kelman also ran the experiment, experiment with non-pilots. After three hours of perceptual training, the non-pilots got to 60% accuracy and a reaction time below 20 seconds. In other words, non-pilots with three hours of perceptual training were outperforming pilots with 2,500 hours of flight experience who didn't yet have the explicit perceptual training. Another real world problem that Kelman and his team tackled was teaching fractions to middle schoolers. Now, we don't often, I mean, often we don't, some, some people do, we often don't give students a good mental model for understanding how fractions work and why they work. And so a lot of students will just accept that there are rules, they seem kind of arbitrary, so when presented with a problem, a lot of kids will just pick a rule kind of at random and then hope that it applies. And Kelman's work wasn't actually directed at um, teaching students to solve fraction problems. Instead, the goal was to get them to recognize the shape of two specific types of fraction problems. Is it giving them the whole and asking them to find a part, or is it giving them a part and asking them to find the whole? He designed interactive trials using problem formulations in multiple representations, and the student's task was to recognize which of three problems in one representation matched the original problem statement in some other representation, and it was wildly effective. Even though the training didn't address solving actual fraction problems, the student's problem-solving scores improved from 40% in the pre-trial test to 70% after the training. <clears throat> Sorry. And when the students were tested again several months later, the scores held. Over the course of months and years, our brains sort through the noise, identifying the signal. And gradually, our instincts grow. And Dr. Kelman's work shows that not only is it possible to take this haphazard process and make it deliberate, but in doing so, we also compress the learning that happens naturally into a much shorter amount of time. And so the question that I keep coming back to is how all of this applies to programming. What is it that programmers with some particular expertise perceive that those without it don't? A few years ago, I wrote a blog post inspired by, <clears throat> inspired by a tweet that a friend of mine wrote. I'm sorry, could I get some water? <clears throat> right, so I wrote a blog post a few years ago, and um, it was inspired by uh, something that a friend of mine had posted on Twitter, and before posting my blog post, I, I showed him the code example, and he was like, nice, I like it. You have a race condition on line 26. <laughs> like some people notice problems at a glance. Uh, it goes deeper than that. For example, when reviewing code, the types of problems that people typically notice seem to be correlated with their degree of expertise, thank you, in various areas. So people with less expertise tend to point out more low-level, standalone, nitpicky problems, and people with more expertise tend to focus on problems that aren't necessarily in the code in front of them, but in the system as a whole. I saw an example once where a pull request was adding a caching library to a code base, and one of the reviewers pointed out a confusing variable name, and then another reviewer came along and was like, what metrics show that adding caching here actually fixes the problem? I spent a few years working at GitHub, and for a couple of those years, I was working on GitHub's REST API, which is enormous, and it has extraordinarily complex authorization logic. You can authenticate in a multitude of different ways in different circumstances, and crucially, GitHub doesn't want to leak private data, so there were about a 1,000 integration tests that were specifically testing authorization logic in the API layer, and at one point, I noticed that these tests were making 2,500 database calls each, and I don't know what it's like right now, 
But back then, the continuous integration system had a time budget, and these tests in particular were hitting that budget all the time, which caused CI to time out, which meant rerunning the entire test suite, which makes it take twice as long, which is pretty bad during development, but during deploys, it was really, really painful. So I submitted a patch to a test helper for this part of the code base, and it reduced the database calls in these tests by 40%, which when you think about it, is still really bad. But um, the tests were mostly not timing out on CI anymore. So I am not a 10x developer. This was pure dumb luck. I was chasing down a flaky test, and I happened to notice this as a side effect of that. I have no particular wizardry whatsoever when it comes to troubleshooting performance problems. People who are really good at troubleshooting performance issues seem to know instinctively what tools to reach for, when to reach for them, where to apply them. They will look at a morass of dot data. They will eyeball thousands of lines of a profiler report and they'll point to one line and say, that number seems suspiciously high. How do they know? It's impossible to say, they just do. I think every single technical talk that I've given in the past 10 years has been about tearing a code base apart and putting it back together again. There's clearly a lot about this process that I can explain, but people invariably ask me, how do you know where to begin? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't feel like I know where to begin. I just kind of look around and then I pick a place. And it seems to work out a lot of the time. A colleague and I were uh, wrestling with this, with, with this bug once, and it was the most maddening thing. It was consistently reproducible in production. It was not at all reproducible locally, and we narrowed it down. A particular type of record kept getting saved with the wrong value in a foreign key field, and we were getting a bit suspicious of the many, many layers of indirection and metaprogramming between us and the database because we could confirm that we were setting the right value on that field right before we saved it, but then when it came back out of the database a moment later, it pointed to something else, a completely unrelated thing, always the same unrelated thing. And we were completely stumped. How is this unrelated thing getting involved? It made no sense. And in desperation, we started walking other people through our problem. And one of our colleagues was like, wait, wait, wait. What's the ID of that unrelated thing? And so we showed him. And there was a moment of silence. <laughs> and then he said, I recognize that number. I was like, of course he does. That's my SQL's max int. We had mistakenly defined our foreign key column as an int, and it should have been a big int. And in less than three seconds, our problem went from being incomprehensible to being forehead slappingly obvious. In production, the table that the foreign key points to has billions of records. Of course, the value would get truncated. Of course, we would never trigger this in, uh, in development. The turning point in almost any debugging story is not that someone sees what the problem is. No, they see a thing which reminds them of something that they happen to know, and then they pose the right hypothesis, and it leads them to try the right experiment from which they discover what the heck is going on. Like something triggers their spidey sense. About 10 years ago, I was uh, having a conversation with Sandy Metz, the author of Practical Object-Oriented Design in Ruby. I had begun obsessing over this exercise on exorcism that asks people to generate the 99 bottles of beer song, which is deceptively simple. It has just enough algorithmic complexity to get you into a whole world of trouble. And I complained to Sandy that every single solution I had seen was basically terrible. I mean, they were creative and fun, and they worked. They solved the problem. But everyone seemed to be contorting the complexity, trying to hide it in some way or another. And I told her I despaired of seeing a truly good solution. Frankly, I wasn't even sure there was one. And she came back a few days later with not one, but four decent solutions, one of which uh, had an abstraction that didn't hide the complexity but seemed to make it go away. And I asked her, how did you know? And she was like, it was obvious. And it took us three years to reverse engineer her instinct into a book that breaks it all down into explainable concepts. Now, a lot of programming does have to do with explainable concepts, with knowing facts and being able to explicitly verbalize ideas and execute specific sequences of steps. 
but a huge amount of programming expertise seems to be rooted in perception. It relies on this gut sense, this ability to make snap judgments, to just know. So in a fit of optimism, I have put together an amateur's guide to designing perceptual learning training materials. It's based on Kelman's work. The basic component is brief classification episodes. And by brief, I don't mean instantaneous. If you can puzzle something out logically and deliberately, then go ahead, give your brain the time to do so. But if not, that's fine, just guess. Your brain's gonna figure it out eventually. Now it's crucial that the learner make active judgments. Just showing someone something and then telling them the answer is not gonna be of much use. And then when they've made the determination, give them explicit feedback. That's basically it, but, but for this to actually work, you need a really, really good data set. It needs to have a huge number of examples with no duplicates. The brain needs a massive amount of complex variation. This variation should include not just the relevant features, but also you want to vary all of the irrelevant characteristics. The brain is going to detect the underlying invariants, the parts that don't change. That's the whole point of the, uh, of the exercise. So you need all that noise, you need those distractors, otherwise the brain has no way of figuring out which distinctions are actually meaningful. If you don't have enough distractors, the brain is going to start assigning meaning to certain irrelevant characteristics, which happen to not vary enough in the specific data set, which is how we teach our brains to be biased. So that's the idea. Short interactive tri uh, trials targeting a specific perceptual skill using a huge, messy, complex data set with known answers. So if we want to apply this to the craft of programming, we need to identify the target skills to train. And that assumes that we understand something about the perceptual expertise that we want to target. So let's say that you want to develop perceptual training materials to help people get better at dealing with production incidents. If having the pager is not your happy place, where do you begin? So there's this whole other field of research. Um, it's called naturalistic decision making. Uh, and it's basically about extracting tacit knowledge from experts. It's basically a way of catching experts in the act of doing their mysterious thing and then figuring out how to tease out what's going on. And I am not gonna go into the details of this, but if you want to dig into it, I recommend starting with the book Sources of Power, How People Make Decisions by Gary Klein. It's really, really good. Okay, so let's assume that you've understood something about what's going on in the expert's mind when they're doing their thing. What makes a good target for perceptual training? There seem to be two ways of defining this. One is to identify a small, unambiguous taxonomy. Is the day-old chick male or is it female? Is the fraction problem asking us to find the whole or find the part? Is the baby fussing because she's hungry or because she's tired? Is the data structure valid syntax or invalid syntax? Here, we're letting the brain discover for itself which diagnostic features are relevant and how they relate to the taxonomy. The other approach is to find a skill that consists of a well-defined activity. So this is like the visual navigations that the pilots do. You eyeball the terrain, you identify the matching locations on a map. There is a taxonomy, kind of, somewhere in that data, but it's very complex and it's not explicitly defined. The brain is left to its own devices to decide both which dimensions matter and how to categorize them. Once you understand the fundamental distinction that you're targeting, the problem is reduced to generating or curating a data set. There's some ma napkin math floating around that suggests that for the past 50 or so years, the number of programmers in the world has doubled, roughly, every five years. Another way of expressing this is that at any one time, 50% of all programmers have less than five years of experience. Over the course of 10 or 15 years, many of them will likely develop perceptual expertise in some areas, but you can imagine that a huge proportion of these developers will rarely be exposed to the good patterns, 
the useful distinctions. The signal might forever be drowned out by the noise. Their brains won't stand a chance. And we can do better. We can deliberately compress these lessons, allowing new developers to waste less of their time wrestling with the mechanics of programming and spend more of their time solving meaningful problems. Thank you.